All right. So today we're going to take a look at section 3.1, which is about linear models. And you can see from our ever growing list on this left hand side, all of the things that we have uh, learned or have been exposed to over the last two weeks. OK. Um, and so being able to do all of the calculus or the foundational calculus, uh, being able to apply all of that and our algebra to solve these different types of equations would be really important as we're heading into uh, the end of this unit. And then late last night, well, not that late, but in the evening yesterday, I did post a video on 2.6, which is about Euler's method. And I did want to make a quick note on this. That is, um, there is a calculator link on Canvas. All right. So in case you didn't get a chance to watch the entire video, there is a calculator link on Canvas um, that I would encourage you to use for your homework. And if you had a question on the exam that asked you to use Euler's method, you could use this calculator link to calculate things. OK, so with Euler's method, um, it's less about the comp computation because we tend to have computers that just do it for us. Uh, so I don't want us to sit and worry too much about like calculating every little thing, but I would maybe just practice using that calculator on Canvas um, to make sure that you know how to uh, enter information and where your output information is, OK? Um, but the bigger question here is what we're going to dive into now, which is why does what we learn matter? Um, and it really comes down to a few different types of applications, OK? So for this first unit, we're going to focus mostly on linear models. Some of these will be familiar, depending on what your calculus experience was like, and some of them will be a little bit new. And so today, we're going to take a look at growth and decay. That might be familiar for us uh, from Calc 1 or Calc 2. We're also going to take a look at Newton's law of cooling. And again, that might be familiar from maybe pre-calculus or Calc 1 or Calc 2, depending on your instructor. Um, and finally, we are going to take a look at something called mixture problems. And of the three on the list, my guess is that the mixture problems will be the newest for us. Um, and maybe as we are preparing for Tuesday's exam or doing the homework, maybe these first two, the growth and decay and Newton's law of cooling are more familiar, but maybe we wanna make sure that we put in that time to look at the mixture problems as well, okay? So that being said, let's go ahead and take a look at growth and decay, all right? So what we have with growth and decay is we are given a differential equation that looks something like this, all right? So something, some uh, amount of something like the dx is changing with respect to time. And it turns out that it is a direct relationship that is just a constant times x. And so anytime you see this differential equation, we want to be thinking, ah, it connects to growth and decay. We'll also be given some initial conditions. So x of t naught or t sub zero is going to be our x naught or our x sub zero. And so these initial conditions will be something we'll be able to use, but we're also going to practice finding those. Okay. And so I want to list out a couple things here before we get started. And that is that k is often referred to as the constant of proportionality. Right? So it's a fancy word, just constant of proportionality. But all it means is that constant that we are multiplying our x value by 
And that helps us talk about how quickly or not quickly something is growing or decaying. The other note I want to make here is for the T sub zero or the T naught. Oops. This T naught right here. This is just the time at which we start. All right, the time at which we start. Sometimes that's zero, like we just call it, we're starting at zero. Sometimes it's a different number. It's just all relative, like whatever time we start counting at, then that's our T naught, and that will produce our X naught or sort of our amount that we have at that time. But one thing I wanted to do for the growth and decay is actually talk about how do we get from this differential equation to a general form of a solution? And it actually turns out that we've seen this before, um, but we haven't necessarily given it a name, okay? And so if you look at this differential equation, and let's go ahead and write it here, we have dx dt equals kx. Would you say that this is going to be linear, exact, or separable? What are our thoughts? Separable? Yeah, this is going to be separable, right? In this fact, was... we had a question sort of similar to this on the first homework where it was like, of all of the integrals we were doing, it was maybe the most straightforward one, right? And so this, we might note, is separable. So let's go ahead and separate, right? So I'm going to multiply both sides by dt, and I'm going to divide both sides by x. All right. So I separated it. I've got my x dx on one side. And I typically, typically we keep our constant with the dt term. OK, so we kind of don't move more than we have to just to make our integration a little bit easier. And now if we integrate both sides, we'll find out that we end up with our natural log of x on this side. And on the other side, we have kt plus some constant. OK, so we have kt plus a constant. And now how would I get um, this in terms of an explicit solution. But what I need to do. Solve for T. Uh, if we want an explicit solution in this case, I think we want to solve for X, not for T. Mm. OK, so how do we get X all by itself? Ah, I see it in the chat. We can take everything as an exponent of E. The fancy word for that is we are going to exponentiate both sides. So we've got E to the natural log of X equals E to the KT plus C. And that plus C is in the constant, is in the exponent. OK. Now, what does this allow us to do? Well, on the right hand or on the left hand side, we get x all by itself. And on the right hand side, we can take this, we can split it into two bases and powers. And then because e is a number and c is a number, we typically write this just as a c. So we would get x equals c e to the kt. All right. So in general, we would call this a derivation. How do we get this as our formula for uh, rates of change, like growth and decay? Well, it turns out we started with this differential equation that was separable, and we were able to maneuver our way to the end. Okay. 
Now, when we're working through the problems, I do want us to show this step, but we'll just be replacing K with numbers that we have from a given problem, okay? We'll also get a chance to practice initial conditions, applying initial conditions so we can find our C value. So let's take a look at these examples right here. Okay, I think we've got two examples for our growth in DK. So for example one, um, this kind of question might sound kind of familiar to us. Uh, if we've ever taken pre-calculus, we've seen this kind of question, or even in Calc 1 or Calc 2. But we have a bacteria culture. It's growing at a rate proportional to the amount present. And as soon as I see that word proportional, I'm thinking uh, this is going to be a dx dt equals kt situation or sorry, kx, and this k is that constant of proportionality, okay? So when we read a problem, we see that word proportional, we're thinking this differential equation. Now we have some information. We say after one hour, there's a hundred, a thousand strands of bacteria in the culture, and after four hours, there are 3,000 strands. Find an expression for the approximate number of strands of bacteria present in the culture at any given time. And so the way we're going to structure these questions is we're going to start by taking our differential equation and we're going to solve the differential equation. So we're going to solve the differential equation. And so we're going to do something very similar to what we just did in our general solution. Now you can use whatever letter you want. I'm gonna call, uh, instead of having an X, I'm gonna say P, P for population. And I'm gonna say that I have a change in population with respect to time or DP, DT. And that's gonna equal K, that proportionality constant times P. And so if we were to walk through and solve this differential equation, we would separate it. So dp over p equals k dt. We would integrate it. And we would obtain natural log of p equals kt plus c. Now, a lot of folks have been asking really good questions around, well, when do we need our absolute value? When do we not? And I think that this is a great example of when it's OK to drop the absolute value, because p represents population. And according to the information here, the amount of bacteria is actually increasing. So we would never expect for P to be negative. So it's okay to say, based on the context of this, I don't need the absolute value bars. And so when we exponentiate both sides, we're gonna get P equals E to the KT plus C or P equals C e to the kt. All right, so we're practicing going through that solving, showing the separation, showing the exponentiation, and showing that finding that constant in the front, okay? And so for some of you on that homework one, I was like, you left it as something like this, which is absolutely fine. And then I said, by convention, we typically do this. And the reason is when we're finding uh, an application to an actual problem, we want to sort of condense how many places we have to calculate in order to find the constant value. But after we solve, we are going to apply our initial condition. Now, in this case, we sort of have two separate data points. We have information about after one hour, we have a thousand strands. And after four hours, 
we have 3,000 strands. And so let's take the green one, the one hour and a thousand strands, and let's go ahead and plug those in to our general solution. And so when we do that, we're gonna get 1,000 equals C E to the K times one, right? Now at this point, if that's all I do, I still have two unknowns. I have a C and I have a K. And I, I need to be able to find both of these values. So that should say to us, well, we're gonna need a second equation because we have two unknowns. And so that's where the second one, the four hours and 3000 strands is gonna help us find the missing variables. So if we plug that information in, we'll get 3000 equals C E to the K times four. So this came from the orange information and this one came from the green. Okay. Um, we have a few choices here. I think we could find C first or we could find K first. It tends to be nice to find the K value first, but we're gonna use the idea that the C in the green equation is actually gonna be the same C as in the orange equation, right? In other words, if I take this and I solve for C, I'm gonna get 1000 over E to the K. And if I take the orange one and solve for C, I'm gonna get 3000 over E to the 4K. So all I needed was to divide and I got C equals C equals. And now I can set those values equal to each other. And so I'm gonna get 1000 over E to the K equals 3000 E to the 4K, right? We do a little bit of algebraic manipulation. We'll end up with e to the 4k over e to the k equals 3,000 over 1,000. So we sort of cluster all the k's on one side, all of the numerical values on the other side. We'll get e to the 3k equals 3. How do we get that k out of the exponent? Well, we got to natural log everything. And then all we have to do is divide by 3 to get our k value. Okay. So let me just pause here for a moment. We have solved our differential equation. We've applied the initial conditions and we've been able to obtain a K value. But the whole reason why we had sort of the green equation and the orange equation is because we have two unknowns, right? We wanna know K, that's our proportionality constant. That tells us how fast the bacteria is growing in population. But we also need to find C, all right? So we wanna find our C value. And it, in particular, it turns out that the C value actually tells us how much bacteria we had at the very beginning of this experiment. In other words, at t equals zero, what was, how many bacteria were there, okay? So we're gonna take our k value. We can plug it into either this one or this equation and then solve for c. I put it into the 1000 one just because it was a little bit simpler to do. And with a few magical computations, we end up with 694 as our capital C value. Now we found a lot of information, but we wanna make sure we express our final answer according to what the question is asking. So it says, find an expression for the approximate number of strands of bacteria present in the culture at any time t. 
And so what we need to do is we're going to grab this initial uh, uh, general solution and whatever C value we found, whatever K value we found, we're going to plug those in. And that's it. Okay. So for question for our third step, we're going to write our final answer. And I'm just going to go ahead and fill in everywhere I see a C, I'm going to put 694. And everywhere I see a K, I'm going to write natural log of three over three. Okay. So I will get population equals 694 E to the natural log three over three T. And that, my friends, is our final solution. Okay. Any questions on example one so far? Uh, I'm sorry, I was writing a lot during that. Can you, uh, what equation was it that you used to plug the P equals 694E? Great question. So this, our general solution that we solved in step one, all we needed to do was plug in our C and our K value into there. Thank you. You're welcome. Judy, in the future, will um, after finding her final answer, will there be like a question asking like later on, like you're given a specific time, find P also like to add on? That's possible for sure. Okay. Yeah. I would say maybe not necessarily for an exam question because so much of the work in a differential equation class, I'm more worried about this. I trust you to plug in a number for T and calculate from there. Okay. Okay. <laughs> uh, question, so uh, from K at the bottom, K equals LN three over three. Mm -hmm. uh, so we went from there to up above C equals 1000 over E to the LN three over three equals 694. Yeah. Where would, uh, where does that C? Okay, uh, okay, oh, got you. We're looking at the, the left hand or the green, yeah, how it becomes that. Okay, got you. Thank right. you. Okay. <laughs> no worries. Could you have also chosen to put it into the other equation and got the same answer if you put it into the 3000 over e to the 4k? Same thing, yeah. Yeah, I think it was the laziness thing. I was like, I don't want to multiply K by four and then do it. But if you're putting it into a calculator, then it doesn't really matter. Um, in case we've never used this platform, um, you may have your own calculators at home, which is fine. Uh, I quite like the Desmos calculator. It looks like some people think it's just for graphing, but the left-hand side is actually also a calculator. Um, and so if you never had one of the fancy like TI calculators where you can see everything you typed, the nice thing about the Desmos calculator, you can see what you're typing in. So if you feel like your answer might be wrong, you can just double check, like, did you type in all the numbers correctly? All right. Any other questions about example one right now? All right. So we're going to use these same three steps to help us solve example number two. OK, so we're going to start off by solving our differential equation. Then we're going to apply our initial condition. And then we're going to make sure we write our final answer in whatever they're asking for. OK. So let's go ahead and take a look at this. So we have some sort of um, reactor, and it converts this uranium into this isotope uh, for 
I'm not sure what purpose, but after 15 years, it turns out that um, that we have only a little bit of the initial amount that has disintegrated, meaning we have a lot of it still there. Okay, so if you think about this 0.043%, whatever the initial value was, we only lost 0.043%. Okay, that means that we have still like 99 point something percent left in there. All right, so some of these, like when they disintegrate, um, they just take a very long time. Okay, and so what our task is in this problem is to find the half life of this isotope. And so a half life, all that means is how long it takes for a substance to lose half of its value. How long it takes for a substance to lose half of its value. You can think about that like, I know we always talk about half-lives with radioactive materials, which is, I don't know about you, but I haven't really played with a lot of radioactive materials. So it's sort of hard for me to imagine sometimes, but um, you can think about it similar to like, maybe if you have a car, how long it takes for your car to be half of its value. Maybe that's like a better way to think about a half-life, right? It's how long it takes for something to have only half of its value left. And so as we read through this problem, we notice this key word again, that the rate of disintegration is proportional to the amount remaining. And so because we see that proportional, we're thinking we need to have a separable differential equation of the form that we saw on the previous page. And so we're gonna start by solving the differential equation. And we can use whatever letters we want. So I don't want you to think you have to use certain letters, um, but in this case, we might notice that they already tell us that the amount is, they're just gonna call it A, capital A. And so when I write my differential equation, like over here, I did dp dt equals kp, because I said p was the population. So for example, two, I might use dA dt equals ka. So we'll get dA dt equals ka. Right. Now, we do have a lot of letters here but it is a separable differential equation. So I'm gonna multiply both sides by dt and I'm gonna divide both sides by a. Conventionally, we leave the k or the constant on that right-hand side with the dt. And so we end up with dA over a equals k dt. So we've separated. Now we're going to integrate. We know that the left hand side is going to give us natural log of absolute value of A. And we know that the right hand side is going to give us KT plus. How do we get A out of that natural log? We're going to exponentiate both sides. There we go. I think it was only last year or the year before that I learned the word exponentiate. I had never heard of that before. And I would always just say like E to the power of both sides. But it turns out there's actually a word for that. And I thought that was kind of cool. Um, so keep in mind, in this context, we are looking for an actual amount of something. And so it wouldn't necessarily make sense for A to be negative, 
So again, after we exponentiate, we can sort of drop the absolute values um, because it doesn't necessarily apply to our context. And then we'll have e to the kt plus c, and we know that we can reframe that as c e to the kt. All right. Now, after we find a c value or a k value, we're going to come back to this equation. We're going to plug in the c. We're going to plug in the k. All right. So what we have right now is a very general solution, but we need to find it for this particular scenario. What about this um, disintegration can we show in terms of the number C and K? And so our second step is going to be apply the initial condition. All right, so we solve the differential equation, we apply the initial conditions, and let's see what we have this time. So it doesn't look like they give us a coordinate, right? In the past, they've given us sort of maybe like in a non-context problem, we'll say like y of zero equals one or something like that. So we have to read a little bit more carefully here. So in this case, they tell us that we have an initial amount a sub zero. What that means is at time equals zero, we have A sub zero. Okay. So if I were to translate that in the problem, I might write that um, A of zero equals A sub zero, right? At the initial time, I have A sub zero. And I don't know how much that is, but it's okay to not know how much that is. And so if I want to apply that initial condition to this differential equation, everywhere I see a T, I'm gonna put zero. And everywhere I see an A, I'm gonna put A sub zero. And so I'll get A sub zero equals C E to the K times zero, all right? We may love E, we may not love E, but E to the zero will always give us one, and that's nice, okay? And so it turns out that C equals A sub zero, all right? The initial amount is always that starting coefficient. All right, and that might be something that we remember way back when we learned about exponential functions to begin with, that this very starting number was always the initial amount. And so here we've shown using initial conditions that that is in fact true, okay? But this allows us to write our differential equation as A equals A sub zero E to the KT. All right, so we found a C value, that's a start. Now, in order to finish this step, we need to find a K value, all right? We need to find a number for K because that tells us specifically how fast something is changing, right? In this case, how fast a value is going down in value or decaying. So, we're going to use other secret pieces of information that were given to us in the problem. And that is after 15 years, we only, we've only lost 0.043%. Okay. Now, if I've lost 0.043%, what percent do I still have left? Ninety-nine point five seven. Yeah, yeah, exactly. We have pretty close to 100% left, but not quite, right? And so if I were thinking about how I would write that so that I could maybe follow that structure for, for another um, question, I would actually say this. I would say uh, one, 
that's like a hundred percent minus I gotta change this percent to a decimal. So it's actually gonna be point zero 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 four three. This is going to say the percent that I have left and percent of what? The percent of the original, okay? So when I plug in this second piece of information, A is really this much. What does it equal? It equals A sub, e, A sub zero E to the K times 15. So we're able to use the fact that in 15 years, we only lose a teeny tiny percentage. So we have most of it left. And now we can go ahead and solve for K, all right? Even though we don't know the initial amount, when we divide that A sub zero away on both sides, it's not gonna matter anymore, okay? So my next step here, I'm gonna turn the things in the parentheses into an actual number. So 0 0.999957 equals e to the 15k. And so I'm able to divide both sides by a sub zero. Now, how do we get that k out of the exponent? Well, we're gonna natural log both sides and that's going to give us 15k equals natural log of 0.99957. And we want k, we don't want 15k. So we can say natural log of 0.99957 over 15. And it would be sufficient to leave our k like that. All right. So we found our C and we found our K. Now we can plug those back in to that general differential equation we had, right? Everywhere we see a C, we can say A sub zero. And everywhere we see a K, we can put in this value. So when we plug things in, we have A equals A sub zero E to the natural log of 0.99957 over 15. That's our K value. So we have a T there. All right. Now in this context though, the question didn't say how long is like just write an equation, right? It didn't say just write an equation like it did in example one. This question actually wants us to find a specific value, okay? In particular, it wants us to find the half-life. So how can we use what we have here to have a half-life? Like what can we maneuver to say, this is what we mean by half We might think back to this definition, like a half-life means how long does it take for something to have half of its original value? Well, I don't know how much I started with, but I know I called it a sub zero. Yeah, so if I want to say a half is left on this side, I would say one half a sub zero. And why would I do that? Well, one half a sub zero equals a sub zero e to this really long decimal fraction thing, t. I don't know a sub zero, but I could divide it away just like I did before. And then the only thing I don't know is the time. 
And so what this last piece here tells us is if I solve for t, it will tell us how long it takes for an initial amount to go to half of the amount that's left. In other words, finding t here will give us the half-life. Okay. So I'm gonna go ahead and divide both sides by that a sub zero. We get one half equals e to that long thing. We are going to natural log both sides so that we can get the t out of the exponent. And then it would be absolutely fine to say t equals natural log of one half divided by that coefficient that I have for t on the other side. Okay. So if you had this, this would be an exact answer. That doesn't necessarily make a lot of sense in our head. So if we sort of turn that into a decimal, we'll get about 24,180 years. I know we're doing a lot of writing, so I'll sort of stop writing for a moment, let you continue to write and maybe talk a little bit about what this means. So we have this isotope. We know that it is uh, disintegrating. And in 15 years, we only lose 0.043%. So like the tiniest amount, we only lose a tiny, tiny bit in 15 years. But this question is saying, how long does it take for it to lose 50% of its value? And if it takes 15 years to lose the tiniest bit, it's probably going to take us a very long time to lose 50%. And in, so in that way, a number like 24,000 years actually makes sense here because this particular isotope has a very slow disintegration rate. It takes a very long time for it to uh, lose amounts of it. And so that's why it's okay for us to get some really large values when we're talking about things like half life. Do we have any questions on example number two? Maybe just one to clarify. I noticed in the first one, I think we used units of hours. And in this one, we're using years. The, it, the units for time doesn't matter as long as we make it constant or just stick with it. Ah, So in the initial problem, you'll notice they tell you after 15 years, and so that's why we want to, our time will still be measured in the same units at the end. Yeah, but like in the first question, it oh, used sorry. hours. So it doesn't matter as long as we just continue, keep the same units of time, it doesn't matter. Or is there ever a case when we need to convert the units of time? Uh, no, I don't, I'm not looking for that level of nitpickiness. I will ask you to answer in the units that I give you. All right, so as long as the units are consistent, then it's fine. All right, any other questions here? Um, yes, uh, just one, it might be a silly question, uh, but will we have one minus zero, 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 four, three? Mm -hmm. Why is there three zeros? Great question, because this, even though it's a decimal, is a percent. And so right. I want to know like what percent is left. So I could do one awesome. of two things. I could say 100 minus 0 0.043, that would give me something in percent. And then I would divide by 100. Or I could say one as a percent, or 100 as a percent is one. 
and 0 0.043 as a percent is this. Okay, so, okay, gotcha. Yeah. Right, thank you. Mm -hmm. All right, so let's take a look at the second flavor of question, all right? Before we move on to this, is this stuff that we feel like we've seen before or is this like, I have never seen this before? Where are we at? This was definitely part of my Calc 2 class, I remember this, and maybe pre-calc a little bit. It's probably like a lot of things. It's maybe been a while. It's been a few semesters since we've seen it. Um, but we're just looking at it through a different lens where we're saying, all right, now, now that we've learned about differential equations, how does this manifest itself in the real world? OK. All right. So let's take a look at Newton's law of cooling. All right. Now, we typically use this as Newton's law of cooling, but it's not to say that we can't use this for situations where things are warming or increasing in temperature as well. Okay. But when we are looking for things changing in temperature, it's usually relative to the environment that we have that object in. And so as a result, the differential equation is a little bit more complex than when we have just regular growth and decay. All right. Now, there's so many different variables that get used uh, for Newton's law of cooling that I just want to make sure we're okay with what each of these variables mean and uh, making sure that we're able to keep track of that as we work through a question. Okay, that's probably the trickiest part about Newton's law of cooling. So we have this differential equation, all right? And we can say that this K right here is actually a constant. So k equals a constant of proportionality, just like we had in the previous problem. Proportionality. Okay. So the k still means we're changing proportionally as we go through. The capital T here. And the T sub M would be important to note, all right? So the capital T, that is just going to tell us about our, I'm gonna put in quotation, ending temperature. I think it'll become a little bit more clear later why I'm saying ending in quotations, but it's typically like where we want the temperature to be or when it says, how long will it take to get to this temperature? That is what we consider the ending temperature. But T with a little M, so T sub M, that refers to the temperature of the medium, okay? And here we mean medium, not like small, medium, large, but medium like the surrounding uh, material, okay? So we might think of medium or surrounding. And that can be the air. So if we have a cup of coffee in a room, the room temperature would be the temperature of the medium or T sub M. Uh, if we had a metal object and we put it in a water bath, the temperature of the water would be considered T sub M. And as we're gonna see shortly, if we have a dead body in a room, the room is gonna be, the temperature of the room will be T sub M, okay? Some books and some resources say T sub S, that is the same thing. They just want to say temperature of the surrounding. So let's just add this here. I will try and use T sub M but if you see another resource that says T sub S, it is the same as our T sub M. And the last few in our initial conditions, we have T sub zero, 
All right, so little t sub zero is our starting time or whatever time that we want at the beginning of a time interval and capital T sub zero, that is going to be the starting temperature of whatever object we are looking at. And so maybe it would be better if I went back to the capital T in the left-hand column and said that's the ending temperature of some object. Could be a pie cooling on a windowsill, could be a cup of coffee in the room that you were too busy to drink because you were working on differential equations. Uh, whatever that object is, could be the metal bar that you put in the water bath but that T sub zero and the capital T refer to the temperature of the object, right? So we're gonna go through the general solution here. We're gonna sort of walk through uh, what each of those steps are to derive the general solution from our differential equation, okay? So I'm gonna write down the differential equation right here, D capital T, d little t equals k capital T minus capital T sub m. Now we're going to go ahead and do a little bit of algebra and I think with this algebra we'll see that we can find uh, a way to separate meaning clump all the capital T's on one side and all of the lowercase t's on the other side. And in particular, I'm going to multiply both sides by dt, but I'm going to divide both sides by this uh, term in the parentheses. So I will end up with dt over t minus t sub m equals k dt. Now we're gonna do a little bit of U sub here, okay? And in particular, we're gonna say U is gonna equal this quantity in the denominator. The reason I want to do that is so that I can integrate that left-hand side and we'll end up with some sort of natural log situation, okay? U is equal to T minus T sub M, DU actually equals dt. And the reason for that is this temperature of the medium, all right, so this one, this very last one here, for our purposes, is going to be a constant value. In other words, if you put a metal bar in a water bath, the water bath will have the same temperature the entire time. If you have a pie on a on top of your countertop, the temperature of your room will be the same. So you're not turning on the air conditioning, turning it off, turning it back on. We're just keeping that constant. And so when we take our derivative, this T sub M will go to zero. But this allows us to integrate both sides. We will end up with the natural log of T minus T sub M. And we'll keep that in parentheses or in absolute value equals kt plus c. Now let's get rid of that natural log. We're gonna exponentiate both sides. And I'm gonna drop the absolute value here, but I'm gonna make a note about what it will mean if we have a positive number difference between t and t sub m and what it means if we have a negative value. So in these situations, it's possible to get a positive value here as well as a negative value, and that will depend on the situation. So we're going to say T minus T sub M equals, and let's jump right to the C E to the K T on the right hand side. So the note I want us to make here is that T minus T sub M that is going to be a positive value 
when we have a cooling situation. All right. So that sort of makes sense because we would never expect for our object to get colder than the room, right? That would be very strange for us. That might be something we would have to report to higher powers that be that we put this object in a room and then it got colder than the actual room. Um, and so that's why we have a positive value when we're using a cooling situation. And similarly, we have a negative value of T minus T sub M when we are warming things. Okay. So the sign here, whether it be positive or negative, actually depends on the situation. All right. Well, let's go ahead and get a explicit solution. So I'm going to say T equals T sub M plus C E to the K T. And now we're going to plug in our initial conditions. That is, I'm going to put in T sub zero or zero for my initial time and T sub zero for my ending temperature. Okay. And so what happens when we do that? T sub zero equals T sub M plus C E to the K times zero. Well, just like before, E to the zero is one. So it turns out that C actually equals T naught minus T sub M. All right. And this is our initial condition piece. So to get a final general solution, we're going to go back to this equation. And instead of writing C, we're going to write it as T naught minus T sub M. So we'll get capital T equals capital T sub M plus T sub zero minus T sub M E to the KT. So if you've ever wondered, where did this Newton's law of cooling come from? This is where it came from, okay? I'm sure you've been waiting with bated breath for years to find out where this equation come, came from and why there's so many like minus this or plus this, but uh, hopefully this gives you a better understanding of where we get those values from, all right? And the other thing I want us to maybe make a note of is about the K value, all right? Because similarly to how this has positive or negative values depending on cooling or warming, that will impact our K value in a similar way. We will expect that K is negative for cooling scenarios. In contrast, we will expect that K is positive for warming scenarios. Okay. So some equations only tell you about cooling. And so in the equation, they build in a negative sign for the K. But all that means is that it's a cooling situation. And it's okay if you get a positive K, that just means maybe you have a situation where the object starts at a lower temperature and it rises to the temperature of the room or the medium that is surrounding it. And so if you've been asking like, when does that absolute value matter? This is hopefully a little bit more clarity on when it matters and why it's important to make those decisions for the scenario. Um, and think about what's reasonable, okay? All right. Let's go ahead and think about how we might apply this to an actual question. And we are gonna be starting with this equation. We're gonna be able to put in some numbers and then we're gonna follow the flow of our um, derivation. Okay, so what we have on this screen right here is like very much in general, 
all of the examples, we'll be making sure that we just plug in the right numbers in the right places. That is genuinely the toughest part about Newton's law of cooling. Okay. So that being said, let's talk about this dead body. I feel like a lot of the law of cooling ones are about like pies or coffee cups. And so I just wanted to find something a little bit different, but we have here a detective arrives at the scene of a crime where there's a dead body. Um, immediately they take the temperature of the body and it's found that the body is currently at 80 degrees. Now the room according to the program thermostat, maybe a nest of sorts, all right? So maybe the nest is saying the room has been constant at 68 degrees. Now, miraculously, they find that after collecting the evidence, so some time has passed, in fact, one hour, in one hour, they're able to collect all of the evidence. I think that might not be realistic, but it works out for our problem. All right, so one hour af after they measure the body, they measure the temperature again, and that body temperature is now at 78.5 degrees Fahrenheit. All right, so it was 80, and then in that hour, it dropped to 78.5. Now, assuming that the victim body temperature was the normal 98.6 prior to death, how long before the de detective arrived at the crime scene did the victim die? All right, so maybe something that is a little bit more applicable, uh, not that you all intend on killing people or anything like that, but uh, you know, if you like the true crime kind of shows, uh, maybe this is more engaging. So we're gonna start though the same way that we started our exponential growth and decay, which is we're gonna solve our differential equation, all right? After we solve, we are going to apply our initial conditions. We're gonna find our C, we're gonna find our K, and then we're gonna finish off by answering the question that uh, is asked of us. So we are going to solve the differential equation. And let's go ahead and write out the general form. So d capital T, d little t equals k, t minus t sub m. And usually for these kinds of questions, I like to make sure I know what my numbers are. And so in particular, I said earlier that t sub m should be a constant for us, okay? And so I like to identify that. I also like to identify my initial temperature. And so reading the problem, what do we think our T sub M is? And what would we write T sub zero equals? Is T sub M 68 degrees Fahrenheit? It is 68 degrees, exactly, right? Because that is the room temperature that is surrounding this poor dead soul. What are our thoughts about T sub zero? Is that 80 degrees? And that is 80 degrees, okay? Now the T sub zero, the reason why I put this in parentheses or, or in quotes earlier is because really at the very beginning, right? From the moment that this poor individual passed, it was 98.6. But we actually wanna find out when it was 98.6. So if we keep T sub zero as 98.6, we actually won't have enough uh, information to solve this differential equation. So we need to think about where we start to have some information. And in particular, we know that at this initial, I'll say that loosely, initial 80 degrees, one hour later, it was 78.5. So I have a little bit more information about what's happening in that hour. Okay, and so we'll be able to use that to help us find our C and our K value in a little bit. All right, so I'm going to replace the T sub N with 68, and then we're going to separate, and then we're going to integrate. So we have D capital T, D little t equals K, T minus 68. 
I'm going to multiply both sides by dt. I will divide both sides by t minus 68. So we have this, we can integrate, all right? We know we do a little u sub on the bottom and we'll get natural log of t minus 68 equals kt plus c. We can exponentiate both sides and we're gonna get t minus 68 equals ce to the kt. I want to make this an explicit solution, so I'm going to add 68 to both sides. And now, if I apply my initial conditions, I will be able to find a value for c and a value for k. And so this is the equation I'm going to come back and substitute in that C value and that K value. So we'll mark this off as step two, where we apply initial condition. And so we can get uh, at T sub zero, I get 80. So that means everywhere I see a T, I'm going to put zero. Everywhere I see a capital T, I'm going to put 80. No matter my feelings about E's, I know that E to the zero goes to one, which makes it a nice number to work with. And we find that C actually equals 12. So we can fill that in to our general form right here, right? We'll just write capital T equals 68 plus 12 E to the KT. All right, now we found our C, but we also have to find our K value because ideally the only things we don't know are lowercase t and capital T. What are our thoughts on how we can find our K value? What might we want to substitute in? Could we use the uh, T of one equals 78.5? Exactly, exactly. So that hidden piece of information here, that after one hour, that temperature dropped to 78.5. Exactly. So in our equation, the little T is gonna be one, the capital T is gonna be 78.5. So we get 78.5 equals 68 plus 12 e to the k, all right, k times one or k. And I'm gonna subtract 68 from both sides. So I will get uh, 10.5 equals 12 e to the k. I'm going to divide both sides by 12. And last step to get k out of the exponent, I'm going to natural log that answer 10.5 over 12. All right. Now, in this case, we do need to be a little bit careful in terms of whether things are positive or negative, all right? So if we actually find a value for this, all right, and I'm going to go ahead and use my Desmos calculator. I do natural log of 10.5 divided by 12. I do, in fact, get negative 
ish. Okay. Meaning that I have a negative K value. And if I go back to what we wrote down earlier, that is good because this body was cooling in the room, right? It would be very concerning. We might need to call X-Files if that body temperature had a positive K and the temperature was like increasing after they died. So it makes sense that we get a negative value. And that's one way that we can sort of check whether our computations are right. Are we getting the types of values that we expect? All right. So we've got a C value, we've got a K value. We have six minutes to find our final answer. So the first thing I'm going to do, I'm going to go back to that equation that I wrote before I applied my initial condition. I'm going to put my C in as a 12, and I'm going to put my K in as this natural log 10.5 over 12. And so now I have an equation that actually matches my scenario, okay? But what is that question asking us? It is asking us how long before the, de the detectives arrived at the crime scene did the victim pass? And so what that is saying is when was the last time that person's temperature was 98.6? So 98.6, what are we going to do with that value? Where do we plug that in? That's your T, right? And then solve for little t. Or that's your big T and then solve for little t. Mm, okay. So we've got 98.6 equals 68 plus 12 e to the natural log 10.5 over 12 t. All right. Well, let's do a little bit of arithmetic together. 98.6 minus 12, or not 12, minus 68 is going to give us 30.6. So if I subtract this quantity to the left-hand side, I'll get 30.6. And then I'm going to divide by 12. Okay. So I've got 30.6 divided by 12 equals e to the natural log 10.5 over 12 t. All right. Let's do 30.6 divided by 12. That gives us 2.55 equals, ooh, look at what we have here. E and natural log, those undo each other. And we're able to find T, I think, as 2.9-ish. So the flow of these questions is actually very similar, even though they have a little bit of a different twist on them. This idea of solving the differential equation, applying the initial value, and then finding the answer relative to whatever has been asked is a nice sort of framework to put there for yourself. Okay. Now, we clearly did not get to the mixture problems, which is okay. Um, I will uh, by tomorrow, post a video that will be the second part. So all of the stuff about the mixture problems. And if we sort of preview that a little bit, 
we will take a look at the mixture. All right, so what the differential equation is, we'll make sure we talk about where the different parts come from. We'll take a look at an example where we are, uh, all of these will actually be sort of some sort of uh, solutions, meaning like uh, you're mixing salt with water and thinking about concentration. Uh, we'll go through a second equation or second example that also talks about salt concentration in water. Um, but in some of these, we're gonna, the scenarios are gonna be different. So one of them, everything is coming into the tank and out of the tank at the same rate. And then the second question, number five, is gonna look at what happens when the in rate and the out rate uh, are the same, but we are looking at, uh, something in the tank that actually already has a certain amount in it. All right, so we'll look at some slightly different scenarios, but my hope is that the setup will be sufficient to help you work through those examples on the homework, okay? Um, we'll leave a lot of the numbers as sort of exact values, and then at the end we'll turn them into decimals, um, but hopefully that will be clear where that is. If you have any questions about that, of course, you are welcome to ask. Um, Do you want us to approximate to a certain number of decimal points or just one, two, four? That's a good question. I feel like if we 